Hello everyone, I'm Bill Harris and welcome to Life Questions, a new program which Channel 44 is launching today. This program will air weekly with a specific focus, looking at life's issues from a biblical perspective. And we want you as an audience to send us your questions and comments. And I'll tell you how you can do that in just a few minutes. But first, let me ask you a question. Has your Bible become outdated, outmoded, and perhaps left behind as this world continues to progress? Or is it that this fallen world seeps further into depravity that such lifestyle concepts as holiness and righteousness appear to be obscure and obsolete to this modern, sophisticated world? You can answer that. And among the ranks of church leadership, from bishops to missionaries and teachers, are those who are in the front lines and down in the trenches every day. These folks are known as pastors. They are the men and women who are in contact with you as the followers of Christ every day. Well, each week we are providing pastors with a platform of discussion on life issues to ask them what in the world is going on mm -hmm. from a biblical perspective. Our guests today include Pastor Brandon Green, of Calvary Chapel of Praise in Lima. Also, Pastor Kim Lyons, who alongside her husband, Michael, pastors in faith ministries in Lima. We also have with us Pastor Tim Benjamin, formerly of Forest Park United Methodist Church, now pastor of Wayne Street United Methodist Church in St. Mary's. And last but not least, Pastor Damien Tibbs. He's pastor of the New Life Christian Ministries here in Lima. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome you to our first program. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy to have you. you all. Let me ask you this. It appears to many in society today that our nation is divided along political lines. She, sharp divisions. We are told, nonetheless, we are instructed by the Bible to pray for our leaders from the top on down to the dog, dog catcher. Mm -hmm. What are you saying to your congregations in this day and time? of a divided nation, how we should be praying and backing up our leaders and in prayer and, and just holding them up before God. We'll start with the lady first. Well, we're just really encouraging our, our body to pray for every leader from the president on down. We encourage it over the pulpit and Bible study, just through ongoing conversation, how important it is to cover our president. We cover him all, every night, mm -hmm. my husband and I. Mm -hmm. we're, we, we're always focused about the leadership over this country and the freedom we have. I mean, it's such a blessing to have the mm -hmm. freedoms that we have, even to have this kind of platform to even be able to do that. So we push it, we mm -hmm. push it. Very good. We'll just go right down the line, go ahead, Pastor. Well, you know, Romans 13.1 uh, 13, says that God has established the authorities or the powers that be. Mm -hmm. And the other scripture that encourages me that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Of the Lord. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like the water course, he's able to turn it any which way he desires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe that we ought to be active participators in politics through prayer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By knowing the issues, by speaking up. Um, and so what I would encourage you to do is to be praying those issues and believing that God is able to take a particular leader's heart yeah. and to conform it and to turn it in the way that this thing needs to move. So I, I also am encouraged this. One day we're all expecting that the government shall be upon his shoulders. Amen. <laughs> and so what can the church do? There's something significant when we begin to pray. And I think also that we vote that our faith isn't without just, you know, words only, but it's in action as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Pastor Tibbs. The um, verse that you uh, were referring to as far as about praying for our leaders in 1 Timothy 2, and at the end of that, it tells why. It says uh, in verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. So that should be our goal as we pray for our leaders that God would save them yeah. and fill them with his spirit so that they can rule righteously. I mm -hmm. want to extract one word out of that verse, the word truth, which seems to be a, a, a commodity that is in great demand, but the <laughs> supply is not all that great, is it? Yeah. What are you saying to your congregation nonetheless, Pastor Green? Uh, I believe uh, what I'm looking at is uh, our leaders are making big decisions that are going to affect the course of our country for generations. Yeah. I don't want them making those decisions unless they're undergirded with prayer. And that, that's our responsibility. Mm -hmm. right. you know, and I think even Jesus talked about the fact that if you don't you know, agree or you're not of the political persuasion of the leaders, 
Jesus said, pray for your enemies at least. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, yeah. is, is to undergird the whole thing because we don't want them doing what, we, what they have been elected to do without an undergirding a prayer, and that's our responsibility. Yeah. You know, my pat, right. go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just thinking, and then we have to trust their decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're praying over our president and over the issues, then we have to trust the outcome. Right. And I think sometimes when the outcome doesn't look like what we thought it should look like, you know, we get a little disturbed, but we have to trust God in everything. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, and we, and we need to be able to trust having taken responsibility yeah. for our part of yeah. praying right. first. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And not to get caught up in, in this divide mm -hmm. through the media outlets as well. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a platform through CNN on yeah. one side and Fox News on the other, sure. <laughs> and they're vying for their base's yeah. attention through rhetoric. And so it's important not to get lost in all that we ingest, but that we are grounded in the word of God, mm -hmm. that we're continuing to hold each other accountable mm -hmm. by the praying yeah. and by encouraging uh, in challenging each other into love and good works. Mm -hmm. yes. Very good. Did you want to yeah, I just wanted to say also that it's very important that we continue to allow the church to be the house of prayer because that's exactly what the Lord himself called it. Yeah. And he had a great love for his house. And that's something that upset him greatly when he found something yeah. else was going on yeah. 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 in the house. <laughs> you know, I appreciate that comment, particularly from the standpoint. You ever come across people who feel that prayer is a very passive act? that if all you're doing is just praying, you're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prayer is about shifting responsibility to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and those people, I think, are people who don't have a prayer life, mm -hmm. I would yeah. suggest. Right. right. Yeah, right. They, they, they have a genie who's granting wishes. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So to talk about the need for prayer, my bishop very often says that uh, any success we have is a prayer success first. Mm -hmm. Any failure we have is a, a, a prayer failure first. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure we're praying about everything. Yes, right. And this thing about unity, how can we bring this nation together? We are pastors. Mm -hmm. We say that, well, we have the answers to the world's problems. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. That being said, how do we implement that to bring about the unity we need to have and show even the political world uh, the importance of that unity? How do we do that? We I define ourselves by what unites us. Instead of I define myself by how I'm different from you or different from you, we define ourselves by what, what brings us together because there's a lot more of that. And if we would start there instead of why I don't like you or why I'm mad at you, if we would start at the point of unity, I think we'd go a lot farther. But we want to get on the fringe issues and the outside stuff and let that define us. That's just not the way it should be done. The church must begin to meet again on the common ground of yeah. Calvary. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because that's where it starts. And then as, as far, when you draw far away from Calvary, that's where all these different camps mm -hmm. are set up. But we all have to start at Calvary. So I think we all need to go back there, what draws us together, which mm -hmm. is the blood of Jesus Amen. Christ. Yes. The common ground. The common ground. Because yeah. right. yeah. he's coming to pick up a church on a common ground, mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. one bride. Mm -hmm. So that's very important that we begin to draw Absolutely. back together. Only one, but there won't be a Baptist bride and no. a Methodist oh, bride. No. And a, no? And no. then again, you know, the harvest. The harvest is coming in, and they're coming in with tattoos and yes. nose rings and uh, tattoos on their face and just, mm -hmm. just all kinds of things. And I think Calvary, sometimes the people who are drawn to Jesus have a judgmental spirit, mm -hmm. and so that keeps us divided because you don't look like the church back in the 30s and in the 40s and in the 60s. And that's what I base my Calvary on. But Calvary mm. is the blood of Jesus and it's yes. the spirit of God. And we have to be open enough to love those who are gonna be coming in. Right. And I think that's what divides us, our opinions. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just judging appearance. And you know, you can just be deceived by someone you see. You don't know what God's doing in their heart. Right. You don't know where they are, you know, and I think we have to stop being so judgmental mm -hmm. right. uh, and that will begin to bring in the unity. I find that church uh, on Sundays, a lot of the times if you look over this nation, mm -hmm. it looks a little one note boring. You know, it, it's like, I'm just going to stick with those that vote the way I vote, look the way that I look. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thankful that the Holy Spirit's doing something significant today to bring about real one accordness. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'll say this, unity isn't, I agree about every single thing with my brother and my sister, mm -hmm. but I find that true unity actually stands when there are people of different opinions, mm 
maybe even don't totally agree about certain things. But what we can do is we can come under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. as one faith, one baptism, mm -hmm. one Lord, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we come together and we celebrate our uniqueness, our idiosyncrasies, mm -hmm. and we begin to declare, I love you, even though I may not agree about this exactly. issue or that yeah. issue, yeah. when I can just find commonality and we begin to worship, something significant happens. And so my C note joins with the E note, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then so, and we start to build harmonies. Uh -huh. I think. That's what will draw the world. Yeah. They yeah, will I mean, know that we are Christians by our love. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And Very it's not good. because Very we good. all sound the same either. Yeah. The same. Yeah. And that's what's the interesting thing is about Pentecost. One of the greatest coming togethers ever in history mm -hmm. is it says we heard everybody speaking in our yeah. own language. Not everybody spoke the same language, but we heard them all the same. Mm -hmm. right. Something was happening there they were sharing that bonded those 3,000 yeah. people for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And I think if we could get back to that, let some of the outside stuff be mm -hmm. interesting discussions for tables like this, yeah. mm -hmm. but uh, realize that we're changing the world together. We'd be a lot better yeah. off. Mm -hmm. You know, the way you bring Pentecost into it, I never thought of it along that yeah. context. That, yeah. that's, that's very well put. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the model that mm -hmm. the church needs to follow yeah. because there was the birth of the church right there. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's the very model we need to get back right. to. Mm -hmm. Very good, right. very good. Yeah. Well, let, let's change the subject. I, I'd, like, I'd like to talk, to about, talk about youth. Mm. We're, we're in a country right now where a lot of our young people are going out of the world backwards. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean this as a put down. I'm, 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 I'm speaking out of concern. I'm talking about the opioid crisis that's taking a lot of our young people out of here prematurely. Mm. They're looking for a thrill in life. Mm -hmm. Life is so bad that they're turning to drugs to try to find relief. Mm -hmm. what, what does the church have to offer in this day and time? Well, I, I feel like it can be so overwhelming because we're, we're trying to fix everything very quickly and, you know, we're a little bit behind, uh, you know, in this matter. But I, I believe this. I can't sweeten the whole Pacific Ocean, right? But I can take a picture and I can pull it up and I can sweeten that picture. Don't lose focus of the impact of investing in one or two or even if your church is able to begin to build support groups. Uh, you know, a lot of the church's attitude was, I don't want the youth to come in here playing their type of music, tearing things up, but I'm reminded as I have a little one and another one on the way that uh, a house needs to be lived in or else it becomes a museum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so it's very significant that we begin to build a platform first. We're not trying to uh, clean them up before we catch them. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that yeah. we're present. And then they can hear our proclamation. Yes. Yeah. It reminds me of something I heard an old uh, Christian say one time. The Lord called us to catch the fish, not to clean the fish. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. his job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Very good. Yeah. And, and to get them to hear our proclamation, that's exactly, that's exactly our purpose. And our proclamation is hope. We are the antidote to despair, which I think is driving a lot of this opioid problem. Mm -hmm. People have nowhere else to turn, they think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that they, they turn to a very, very bad place and go to have very bad things happen. Our proclamation is exactly the opposite of that. We're giving you hope without the dangerous side effects. Right. And I, th I think if we could get people to uh, join into that and become part of the message that we're proclaiming, I think it would help. Yes. You know, some people think that, well, the church doesn't have enough pool tables, enough ping pong tables to keep the kids busy. Well, we, they need to play. They need mm -hmm. that type yeah. of atmosphere, right. too. But it's more to that because what yeah. the enemy is doing to the children gets right to the core of the sinful nature. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what has to be counteracted. How yes. do we do that? Well, John chapter 8, verses 34 through 36 say this. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. So these people that are uh, addicted to drugs and addicted to substances, they're slaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they need a new master. Mm -hmm. ah. and, and Jesus Christ is that master that we have a responsibility of introducing them to. Mm -hmm. So I, again, I do think it's important that we do partner with mm -hmm. some of the uh, crisis centers that are, are helping people. Yes. Because uh, they're yes. taking care of the natural side mm -hmm. uh, right. of, of the, the addiction. Mm -hmm. But we know that it has a much deeper spiritual oh, yeah. hold on their lives. And that is where Jesus Jesus Christ can come in and break those chains of slavery and so they can they will no longer be slaves to sin but they can be his sons and yeah. enjoy freedom yeah. and, and they can see the love I think they yeah. need the 
I think a lot of reasons they're uh, turning towards other affections, you know, or putting their affections in other things, is the lack of love, the mm -hmm. lack of love that they feel. The and lack identity, of would you say? Yes, identity sir. as well? Yes, mm -hmm. sir. And I think even as we go into and partner with those agencies and we give them the word, we always have... We, we have a responsibility to demonstrate the word, to love them, to stay consistent. And I was thinking about that question. They don't have consistency in their lives mm -hmm, for change. Mm -hmm, do, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, they will, mm -hmm. if we plant the word, we know the word's gonna be there and it's gonna grow. But we need to show the love of Christ to these kids. Mm -hmm. You know, they need to see that. We're lacking fathers and mothers yeah. in the faith. And it's because we've been intimidated. They're, they're coming, they look a lot different. Oh, and yeah. here we've got, you know, people in their 50s and 60s and, you know, they're like, what, what do I have to offer? Mm -hmm. Please do not underestimate the power of mentorship oh, yeah. and fathering someone back to life. Let them yeah. borrow your faith mm -hmm. because they're in the NICU, spiritually speaking, they're, and they're, they're just barely hanging on. Yeah. But your faith could, could be nourishment to them. It, it could be palpable to them to which they could begin to draw from and start to grow and start to be strengthened in their inner man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this idea that we retire from Christian service is, right. is a fallacy because mm -hmm. there's a there, we, we need those people to come in You're and come right. alongside our kids mm -hmm. and uh, to be able to to show them the way mm -hmm. yeah and to yeah. affirm them absolutely yeah. and to be transparent you right. know because oftentimes when we come with our instructions and we come with the word, mm -hmm. you know, they're looking at us like we've never had a crisis, like we've <laughs> never had a problem, right. like we've never had, you know, anything that had us enslaved. And I think transparency, uh, along with mentorship, mm -hmm. uh, will help them see that you can take a lick and keep on ticking, that you, <laughs> that you can persevere through this thing because mm -hmm. I went through this. I know it's different, yeah. mm -hmm. but enslavement is enslavement. It's yes. captive. Yes, yes, and I think they need more of that as we mentor them. Yes. You, you mentioned something earlier. You, you talked about the parents. And you will note that in this opioid crisis today, social workers across this nature, nation are grappling with the fact that more and more grandparents are having to take care of the Absolutely. children yeah. because the parents are strung out yeah. on the drugs. Mm -hmm. how, how, in addition to trying to reach the child, what are we going to do to try to reach those parents? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they're, they're suffering support. from the same despair we were talking yeah. about earlier. They, they've given up hope and they're trying to find hope someplace else and they're not finding it there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And unfortunately, by the time they realize there's no hope there, they're far along. Yeah. They're not beyond hope ever, but the idea that they have done significant damage to relationships and to their bodies yes. and everything mm -hmm. else, it's mm -hmm. done at that point. Mm -hmm. And we've exacerbated the situation by talking what we've seen in the natural. There is the element also of your spiritual authority yeah. That you need to in your prayer mm -hmm. closet, not necessarily you know berate your you know your struggling child, but right. in your it's prayer a, closet, yeah. declare in the spirit what God has said. Declare destiny over their life instead of just continuing to speak death over the situation. It doesn't take much faith just to say how things are going on in their life currently, but if you begin begin to take your authority in the spirit, I believe God honors it. Mm -hmm. And we have to also fulfill the great commission by going to where they are. That's right. Mm -hmm. We can't expect them to come to us. It's not That's their right. nature to come to us. So it's our mm -hmm. responsibility as the church to mm -hmm. go to where they are mm -hmm. and, and shine the light in there. And we have yeah. to recall that God called each of us out of darkness yes. mm -hmm. into his marvelous mm -hmm. yes. light yeah. so that we can go and proclaim yeah. his goodness. So the yeah. more gospel message that we can get out there. So I think the church needs to turn inside out. Yeah. Yeah. In order yeah. for us to have an effect on the world, the church needs to turn inside out and stop having all of our meetings and all of our prayer and all of our focus being in a building and really going out and yes. that's how we'll have an effect, I and believe, on the yeah. world. It's so true because our church, we have a ministry called Be a Witness and it's going out in the streets, knocking on the doors, telling people about Jesus Christ. We've met so many people with so many crises because of that. They never, you know, they hadn't even gone to church before, never mm -hmm. been to church. Matter of fact, one guy had been in Lima for 18 years and had never been to a church. Wow. And he was blessed by the fact that we were going door to door, mm -hmm. just asking, do you know Jesus? Just presenting the gospel. If they mm -hmm. wanted it good, if they didn't, we, you know, we yeah. didn't push it. But I am, I'm in total agreement that we do have to get outside the church walls. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to see what's out in the streets. You're going to see what's really going on. Sometimes we stay in our own little place where we're comfortable 
and we don't really we, we're not affected by the issues because mm -hmm. we're not it's not visible in our mm -hmm. church or but when you go out there in the streets you see a lot of things yes. mm -hmm. you see yeah. despair yeah. Yeah. right and you and, see all that and, and you get attention because that person whose door you knocked on wasn't expecting to see exactly. a church show up at their right. door right. and they're like wow this is something new yeah. and these people actually care more yeah. than about yeah. paying for this building and yeah. that's a great statement right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's excellent yeah. You know, th th you're talking about homebound missionary work, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I was on my way to China once, and uh, I was sitting across the aisle from a gentleman who was on that plane smuggling Bibles into China, wow. mm -hmm. you know. But I, I bring that up to say this. We are a mission-centered nation in terms of the church. Yes. And we have large budge uh, budgets for missionary work. But sometimes I see in our churches there's a greater budget for the foreign missions field than there is right around the corner. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what you're speaking to is we've got to have more emphasis on that, on that group around the corner. And, and you know, we were instructed, our mission is to go, right? Yes. Go and come back and go. You know, it's Jerusalem, it's Judea, it's Samaria, you know. Out of and, uh, most parts of absolutely. <laughs> but what I find the significance is being relevant. We don't have to always look, you know, and try to be cool to just to get a hold of this generation. But I also, on the flip side of that, think that a lot of times churches need to examine what they're doing and wonder why don't students want to come and be a part of a worship experience. Uh -huh. uh, listen, uh, you've had your day to sing your songs. You've had your day to have your styles. And today, I'm, I, I find like there's something, a passion within me that says, whatever it takes to reach and have the whole family together. I, I find it'd be more of a blessing to me as a grandfather to have my little ones. I may not even care about the music, but you know, if, if they're yeah. declaring the word of yeah. God and it's life giving, mm -hmm. I find that that's something more significant. I'd rather be in church with my whole family than just me segregated, yeah. worshiping Amen. in my own style and creating an atmosphere where they feel loved and accepted. Mm -hmm. and, How do you, and we have a tradition for that in the United Methodist Church. Uh, back in the beginning when John and Charles Wesley were starting the Methodist Church, one of the things they did is they went in and took the bar tunes and rewrote them with Christian lyrics. Right. I mean, I, I mean imagine trying something like that today. Yeah. And I, I, I think they did that because they knew the tunes, they just changed the words. Yeah. And that made it applicable then to the people who were singing those yeah. songs. Right. Yeah. How do you do that? And how do you convince the church board to go along with what you're saying without somebody feeling, well, you're compromising the gospel if you're going to change this song and if you're going to change this style of worship, you know, we've been doing it this way for a hundred years, by golly. Yeah. Why change you, now? You remind them that back in the day, they had the same fights when they were putting pipe organs in churches. Is or that right? Chanting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Or when they were chanting yeah. with no music. <laughs> yeah. My mom went to a church where they, you, mm -hmm. it was not yeah. uh, accepted to have any instruments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're in a place today where we, we need to be relevant and we need to be full of compassion towards those that are walking in the doors of our church. And, and I, I feel so strongly about this that today is a day where we begin to say, you know what? The time is growing short. What are we actually doing to invest in this generation yeah. that is coming up? Because we've already reached the reached, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Very well put, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Very well put. Well, now, it, it, should a church then have a marketing strategy or a marketing Absolutely. plan, yeah. so yeah. to speak? Yeah. 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 If, if you don't, you're sunk. Yeah. 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 yeah, because, you know, I know we're not selling anything and we don't have products with, with price tags on them and things like that. But we're still in the in the sales industry. You know, we're trying to help people understand that we can improve your life and, and, and do some good things and help you do some things. Because God has some great things that he wants to do for you. He has some great things he wants to do through you. Yeah. And, and that, that's the message that we're, quote unquote, selling. And, and that markets mm -hmm. very well. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, through, through you know, website traffic and uh, billboards and, you know, whatever way we can get out. Ep Social uh, media. Yeah, and even yeah. opportunities like this here yeah. to be able to yes. go out and, and reach to people in ways that they're not used to, like yeah. knocking on the door of yeah. somebody who never expected a church to be there. That, that's how we get by some of that. And I yeah. think that's, I don't know if I would say it's important. I would say it's necessary. Yeah. Okay. Jesus said that, that the world was more shrewd. He applauded them for yes, their shrewdness yeah. yep. in comparison to the church. Mm -hmm. yep. in, in the remaining time, let's just take a moment. Could you, each of you, just profile your church, what is significant, perhaps unique, 
About your particular church? Very Our church quickly. is non-denominational. Um, we believe that every age, race, uh, you know, cultural background uh, can join together and worship the Lord with freedom and expression. So our church, you come as you are. Dress how you want to dress. Yeah. What, we love you regardless, but we also believe in instilling the gospel and the strength of the gospel and the word. And the name and address of the church? Calvary Chapel of Praise. Uh, go to our website, ccofpraise.com. That'd probably be the easiest. Okay. Right. And our church is non-denominational. Uh, our focus name. Uh, in Faith Ministries, uh, 1575 yeah. East High Street, um, and we focus on love. We, we love you. Soon as you get in there, we love the hell out of you. We just <laughs> love you. That's what we say. So when people come from the time they hit the parking lot, we're loving them from the time they walk into the foyer. We love them. And we're purposed on diversity and music mm -hmm. uh, because it helps bring and draw in mm -hmm. a diverse group of people. Get right ahead, Pastor. Well, I think my, oh, it's unique about my congregation. It's in St. Mary's, not in Lima. <laughs> but uh, we're Wayne Street United Methodist Church at 130 North Wayne Street in St. Mary's. And what's unique about our church is, is uh, we have two services where we're able to do, you know, our early services, our traditional service where we play the pipe organ, I wear a robe and a tie. Yeah. There's a lot of people from my church who are looking at this guy and doesn't know who he is. Because uh -huh. normally in the second service, I end up in a t-shirt and jeans. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, we have a band that plays there, the Awaken Band, and they're incredible. So, I mean, two very, very different worship styles. But the thing I keep telling everybody, I preach word for word, the same sermon in yeah. each. Why? Because the gospel uh -huh. still applies. That's sure. It still yeah. works. That's right. Yeah. And both. And, uh, you know, we will go 350 people or so on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And it's great to be able to have these kind of conversations because together we can overcome despair and we can overcome some of these problems. At Wayne Street, we're looking for ways to do that every That's day. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yes. That's the tip. Uh, our church is New Life Christian Ministries at 202 West Kibbe. And I preach life to them, basically. Um, God broke it down to me. The L is love. The I is their identity in Christ. The F is for faith. And the E is for eternal purpose. So when they come in there, they, they uh, come in a crisis, many of them, in a love crisis, identity, faith, or purpose. And that's exactly what we give them is the word of God. And it's beautiful to see them come alive. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. That's very good. Very, very well put. Now, our verse in John chapter 1, verse 4, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Remember that, would you please? Thank you for being with us. We'll be back again next week, so tune in again next week. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We are able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.